Hello everyone, it's great to be here, very happy to get the invitation to take part. Um, so yeah, the title of my paper is Drinking in the Pandemic, Politics and the Transformation of Sociability. Um, I think this is a fruitful topic because drinking gets maybe at two things. You know, it's central to the pandemic in terms of transmission of the virus, but also drinking in the sense of like sociability is at the heart of our experience as social beings. So it's very much kind of at the forefront of, um, I guess, the, the pragmatic aspect of the virus, the kind of the, the medical response to it, the epidemiological response to it, but also in terms of our experience of it because of the prolonged lockdowns. And um, so this paper is quite empirical. I think there's some um, theory and philosophy in the background of it but it's largely based on uh, examination of policy and of um, reporting on the pandemic. So, okay. So to give you the, the summary of everything, um, what can we say, what can we say about the pandemic by using drinking, drinking alcohol as a lens to understand it? Um, okay, I would say the first thing is to do with public dramas, the theatricalization of everyday social life. Because drinking has been very much at the forefront of how the pandemic has been um, understood, how it has been represented in terms of a living reality. Um, it is something that has been kind of very prominent in, uh, in yeah, how the pandemic has been represented and how it's, it's, uh, its impacts have been thought of. So I'm going to go over that kind of the, the pandemic and drinking in the pandemic as a type of collective representation of it. Then the other aspect that I'm going to focus on is public health protocols, because of course, what we've seen across Europe and across the world is prolonged lockdowns of, of public houses and cafes and restaurants. And in Ireland, it has been particularly long. And this has been very interesting as a case study for examining the, the impact of the pandemic on social life. And finally, what I want to look at is the effect of the pandemic on the drinking occasion. So drinking patterns, drinking behaviors have changed dramatically over the course of the pandemic. And I want to have a look at that as well. So to summarize what I'm looking at is, or I suppose kind of to look at the conclusions that I want to make about this is that what you see in terms of the politics of the pandemic, in terms of its impact on drinking and what drinking can kind of give us as a sense of its impact is that it is about theatricalization. It's about um, rationalization and the impact of rationalization in terms of the increasing power of protocols in everyday life. And it's about the destructuring of ritual in, in our society. So um, to begin then just thinking about this in terms of public dramas, um, the the pandemic has been very important. It's been represent, it's, sorry, it, the representation of the pandemic has been, has been, it has relied very much on drinking as an aspect of that. Just to give you some examples about that, if you think about Boris Johnson in the UK, um, the pub has been used as this representation of kind of essential Britishness and um, the right of people to patronize pubs has been used as a way to represent a type of kind of essential, essentialist liberal foundation to the British national character. It's been similarly the case in Ireland, which I'll look at in a second, but also we can think about this in terms of the understanding of the West in general, because the pub and association and sociability is really central to the Kind of self-conception of the West and when we think about how effective the lockdowns have been in East Asia this is obviously because of a more centralized state power whereas in the West the the difficulty in in tackling the lockdown has been to a considerable extent rooted in this um, greater emphasis on association in the West. So the point about this then is that Drinking has been made into part of a public drama 
it's being theatricalized it's become part of a kind of like public discussion and public debate and it's been used as a metaphor and a symbol in order to understand the pandemic but not only that it has been used as a metaphor to understand the people in, or, in the sense of understanding the character of the people in terms of understanding the boundaries of the collective identity in terms of understanding the meaning of the suffering that we're going through so it has an escal eschatological and it has an eschatological dimension and there's a dimension touching on theodicy and um, so in terms of looking at this dimension of the pandemic what i have found particularly interesting in my research and i've done quite a lot of research on this is that what we have seen happening is kind of a flip away from the traditionally neoliberal character of the way that drinking alcohol and pubs and drinking establishments have been represented. Um, for the past 40 years or so, in the case of Ireland, drinking has really been represented in terms of liberalization and um, the right to drink, the freedom to drink, um, a transformation of the nature of drinking culture where it's moved into much more cosmopolitan, modern, individualistic, privatized, more kind of drinking patterns based on achieving social distinction. This is really what has been at the forefront in terms of um, what has been promoted, what has been idealized. Um, and what we've seen in the pandemic is a flip. Um, what you see is a return to much more traditional, conservative, nostalgic representations of, of drinking. And I'm talking here about in the way that drinking is used as a metaphor and a representation for the people and the, the behavior of the people. So, I mean, what you can see happening is that there's been a resurrection of the, the big other, the big subjects um, in the pandemic where it, drinking has been used as a way to represent the sacred core of the collective identity. And what you see is the very stereotypical traditional representations of Irishness coming to the fore in these representations. So for an example, what you can see is three major narratives in the representation of drinking in the pandemic. Um, the first one I would call like about the decent folk which is the real people of the society, the people who are at the core of society, who represent its core values, who represent kind of the spiritual essence and true being of the people. Then you have a representation of the infectious and dangerous elements within, who are a source of not only metaphorical infection in terms of infecting kind of the moral being of the, of the community, but also in terms of um, bringing literal infection because of their immoral behavior. And then also you have a representation of drinking that's focusing on the dangers from without. So to go through this very quickly, um, in my analysis of the media reporting of drinking in the pandemic, one thing you see is a very kind of like tragic um, sympathetic portrayal of the traditional publican. And the traditional publican is somebody who is older, who caters to older clientele, whose pub is somehow traditional. The pub is focused on a status group, whether that's kind of a rural community or whether it's kind of an art artistic community. Um, they represent um, the real Ireland in terms of being associated with, again, the rural, the older, Gaelic, uh, Gaelic games. And these are represented in a very, uh, very sympathetic and tragic way. And it's being represented as being um, symptomatic of the disappearance of the true soul of Ireland in the pandemic, the threat to kind of the, the, the spiritual essence of Ireland. On the other hand, you have the source of infection from within, as I mentioned, and this is the idea of um, youth, of mixing, of the global, of vibrancy. So there's a huge amount of very negative reporting of young people, irres irresponsible sociability of venues which are trendy venues in city center locations large venues which previously before the pandemic were the source of much more positive commentary because they were 
embodiments of the liberal modernizing Ireland, now they become very much represented as the source of irresponsibility and Im immorality. And on the other hand, what we have is representations of the enemy from without. And the enemy, the enemy from without is the classical representation of Britain as being the conduit of the negative, um, the negative qualities of modernity. So what we see happening is there's a very strong fear of, um, of Weatherspoons, for example, which is a major pub co in the UK, of entering the Irish market to the weakening of the sector um, under the kind of the, the tough conditions of the pandemic. And what we will have is essentially the introduction of, of a culture industry and model of drinking in Ireland, as opposed to the kind of traditional ideal of the owner proprietor model. Also what you see in the representation as well is a very negative commentary on the charismatization of politics in the UK, which is seen as being in contrast with the pragmatic politics of Ireland. So for example, the kind of rush to open pubs in the UK, the use of pubs as a way to articulate the essentialist quality of Britishness in terms of freedom and, and association and so on, is seen as being kind of like cynical and um, yeah, cynical politicking in the UK, which is different from Ireland. Just to bring that all together, the idea about this is that this is speaking to a shift in collective identity under the pandemic, which is quite surprising because what has been the focus of a lot of analysis has been how in the conditions of neoliberalism, you have the kind of disintegration of collectives, you get liquid modernity, you get the loss of the big other, you get the, the kind of dissolving of hierarchies of value. But in fact, what you see in the pandemic here is in terms of the representation of it through the pub and through drinking is that you get very, very traditional, stereotypical representations of Irishness in terms of a sacred core of the rural, the gerontocracy, the, um, the Gaelic. And you get, again, a very stereotypical view of the, of the threat from within of youth and the youth um, kind of engaging with cosmopolitan and the global. And then again, you have a very stereotypical view of this in terms of, of, in terms of identity, in terms of the other, and the other being Britain as representing the threats of the negative aspects of modernity. So this is like the first thing that you see in terms of how drinking has been politicized in the pandemic. It has been used as a, as a metaphor, as a symbol in order to articulate the collective identity, to articulate the boundaries of that and to articulate the kind of the hierarchy of value within the boundaries of the collective identity. What you also see is the, um, again, the, I guess, the rationalization of everyday life in terms of the great proliferation of protocols in governing people's behavior. That's a very obvious point, but what's interesting, the interesting point of this is how it reveals the tension between law in terms of a kind of mechanistic way of organizing social life and how that intersects with the essential solidarity and trust to underpin that, that the law becomes completely ineffective without goodwill and um, the social solidarity that underpins that. And also the proliferating absurdity as protocols are applied and refined and extended. Okay. So in terms of the protocol, obviously, um, there's been extended lockdown of pubs. Um, this has been largely rooted in goodwill, which is quite interesting because even though it is founded on the Health Act 1947 and the Licensing Acts, there's very few sticks to enforce the lockdown. Um, there's a lack of formal sanctions to take against pub owners who, who, who open against guidelines. And 
there's a very strong unwillingness to use these because of how weak these in fact are. And what this is really speaks to is that ultimately it is social solidarity, goodwill, a sense of, um, of reputation and maintaining good reputation that has underpinned the lockdown. Also what you see quite strongly is in terms of the rules that have been applied is the power of ethnomethods of intersubjective of intersubjective understanding in making these actually functional in any sense whatsoever. Um, and it also reveals <laughs> through this kind of the absurdity of a lot of these, these rules. So for example, when you think about the partial reopening of pubs that happened, there was all kinds of questions about what is a meal and that you could have a meal if you went to the pub, but what is a meal? What are the boundaries of a snack and a meal? What does substantial mean? Uh, what is the length of a meal? You could dine with a close friend, but who is a close friend and how do you define somebody as not being a close friend? You have the kind of the distinctions between wet pubs and dry pubs. Um, you get the kind of the, the rules that, um, that lists of visitors have to maintain, that pubs need to maintain the visitors who patronize the premises for 28 days with a record of what they have eaten. You have- Sorry, John, just to let you know, you've three minutes uh, left of time. Thanks, Paul. You get the rules that some drinks have to have a cap on them and other drinks don't have to have a cap on them. So it's been a very kind of like, I suppose, kind of dramatic moment of representing the absurdity of the law when it extends very, very deeply into, um, into social life. So to conclude with the third thing, and the third impact has been on sociability itself and the rituals of sociability itself. And um, what we can see from anthropology is that drinking occasions are something that have a form. It has a form that, I can't go into this in much detail, but it has a form that is quite cross-cultural. We think about say gift relations and the ritual process as very important concepts for understanding what are the things that order a drinking occasion. And what we've seen in the pandemic is a kind of dramatic destructuring of the drinking occasion. Um, the drinking occasion is something that's been destructured for a long time. Um, if we think about neoliberalism, neoliberalism has had an enormous impact in destructuring the drinking occasion in terms of, um, in terms of creating a culture industry type model of drinking where there is an emphasis on low price, on kind of monopolization and oligopolies using marketing in order to um, shape drinking culture and shift drinking norms. There's been a very long trend of the destructuring of the drinking occasion. But of course, what's happened in the pandemic has been um, in a great intensification of this destructuring. So what you can see is, for example, naturally a privatization. And um, there has long been a very established norm in Irish society that the private sphere is a sphere in which um, you do not drink. That has been breaking down through kind of neoliberal policies, but now that has been really strongly reinforced. Then you get a very strong move towards the mediatization of drinking. So you have off licenses being kept open as an essential service and a huge shift towards obviously drinking through, um, through retail, groceries and, and, and off licenses. But also you get, you've seen an enormous increase in e-commerce. So literally drink arriving on your doorstep. You see a growing ambivalence in drinking where there's division in drinkers where what we've seen is heavy consumers drinking more and moderate consumers drinking less. So we get a split in drinking culture where there is much less of an established core norm and rather like a bifurcation of drinkers. You get a trend towards premium, premium, premiumization where kind of traditional established drinks like say stout has been decimated in the pandemic, which is an established drink of drinking convivially with somebody in an established ritual setting. That's really reduced and instead there's been a move towards premium drinks which are focused on achieving social distinction by being somehow interesting in some way. And also what you're looking at is a concentration and massification of the market where there's gonna be a real, really big um, exodus of small players and an entrance of large pubcos into the market. 
So to try and bring that all together, again, I'll just in 30 seconds, we'll say that what you have seen in terms of alcohol drinking culture in the pandemic has been, I think, kind of a lens into the, the, the impact of the pandemic socially. And it really is about kind of the politicization of everyday life in terms of how an everyday social practice has been theatricalized. It's become part of kind of political dramas in terms of how it's represented. Also in terms of how protocol has penetrated in terms of an, in, an unprecedented extent into everyday life. And finally, in terms of how you get kind of a transformation of everyday ritual. And that has been driven by politics which has long been the case in terms of neoliberalism, but now it's even further with the impacts of, um, of, of policy. So, okay, so that's, that's the end. Uh, thank you very much for, for, your, for your time and I look forward to the comments. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, John. And, and thanks as well for sticking to the time. So the discussants are Eugene and Kieran. So may, maybe we'll take the, the comments from both discussants uh, together and then John, you can come back briefly at the end. Hi, Kieran. Uh, John, sorry, John, thank you very much, uh, Kieran. Thank you very much for a really interesting paper. It's a real kind of mirror held up to Irish society, that's for sure. And I'm, because of the time constraints, I'm going to limit myself to one comment and one question. And the comment is, uh, it's really interesting the picture you draw of um, Britain being held up as the old enemy uh, and their kind of contradistinction to the Irish model of drinking with their devious Weatherspoon industry corporation drinking culture coming in. And it just made me think that it's a kind of irony because of course you get in relation to the Brexit process, you get kind of the same story or a similar story of Britain itself in contradistinction to the kind of Europeans who don't know how to drink so Boris Johnson is always, you know, as you pointed out in your paper, it's about getting back to the pub where conviviality can once more reign and good old English values can reign, not like those Europeans that drink wine or whatever, who drink a pint of beer in the pub. And uh, that, of course, is, you know, harks back to the, the whole kind of period of the Brexit argument when Nigel Farage never seemed to be out of a pub or without a pint of beer in his hand to kind of illustrate the kind of good old English values that were being suborned by these continentals. So it's, it's really interesting to see how that functions into the same or very similar idea can be brought into play in two different contexts. And the question is, uh, I really like your typology of the three different representations of uh, the changes in or the significance of change in relation to drinking in Ireland. And I wondered if the three <clears throat> types that you identify, the gerontocracy, uh, the diseased element within, and the kind of Britain as the modernizing foreign uh, influence, if they are identified with particular political figures or media figures, or if there's a kind of, or if they're kind of free floating and people pick up on them opportunistically in order to create a stir at various different points, or whether there's a a defined profile to who is mobilizing these stories and who is avoiding them. Thanks very much. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, I don't know if I can answer it adequately um, because the, the, the data that I used was the Irish Times as kind of a, as, a, as a way into Middle Ireland and kind of, you know, your kind of, your, the, the major broadsheet newspaper. And the, the journalists you were looking, I was looking at where you have like, you know, for example, Mark, I didn't just focus on certain journalists, but just some that kind of come out quite prominently is, you know, you have Mark Paul, who's the, the business journalist, who's very much into like creative cities and the hospitality sector and so on. But then equally you have like, you know, Fintan O'Toole and you've got David McWilliams, and then you just have the entire raft of, um, of kind of minor stories. Then you have like the political reporters, you know, like Jennifer Bray and, people like that. So I would say that it's an excellent question. I hadn't thought about it before. And my, my impulse is to say that I think it is free floating. I think my feeling was that these were like genres that were circulating 
and you had this kind of eschatological, <laughs> sorry, you had this kind of need for a theodicy to say, what the hell is happening here? We have to put some meaning on it. And in the kind of liminal situation, the genres were, were seized on and kind of indiscriminately by people who were business journalists who are, you know, very much about supporting um, trade all the way through to more conservative commentators. That's what I think, but you, you've, you've made me now question that and I, I'm going to look at that in more detail. And it's definitely something to, to look at. And then, okay, yeah, the so, oh. Sorry, I ju just wanted to bring in Kieran. Yeah. Um, uh, hey. Second discussant before we're... Uh, thanks, Paul and John and Eugene. And sorry, guys, for joining you uh, a little bit uh, late. Um, okay, John, there's so much in that, uh, but I I'll just make a few uh, comments. I really like it. Uh, the pub, uh, drinking, um, ancient and um, anthropologically universal as a sort of ritual space and so on. But the pub itself, of course, is specifically modern. You know, uh, and I'm interested in, uh, as it were, the, the extent to which, uh, you know, the pub, the public house means specifically the imposition of public regulation. In other words, the state, the modern apparatus and so on, legal rational authority into ritual space, taking control of it, governing of it and so on and so forth. And it's interesting just to link to Rachel's paper, you know, the, 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 the publican, the licensee and the sovereign power vested in the licensee, you know, uh, including for instance, barring and so on, that there's no appeal to all of this kind of thing, which is very, very interesting. So that's only been in place since the early uh, 19th century. You know, so you're looking at a very tiny moment in which the ritual around drinking had been governed in a specifically modern way. Then along comes the crisis uh, recently, uh, COVID and so on and so forth, and throws all of that um, uh, in, into, into chaos, into liminality and so on. But I think what's really interesting then is what you pick up on, uh, which is um, the way in which in that context, in that context of radical deregulation, radical scrambling of, a, of what had presumed to be kind of the ritual order of a space and so on and so forth, uh, uh, it doesn't uh, fall into abeyance. Um, the people, there, there's a sort of resource in, in the life world, as it were, where people will uh, attempt to re-ceremonialize and re-ritualize uh, that activity. Uh, and often that, uh, as you were rightly saying, you know, became uh, became uh, uh, turned into a language of kind of some tropes like uh, enmity, uh, chaos, irresponsibility, and so on and so forth. But you know, to a great extent, also uh, was characterized by uh, a very uh, nice form of uh, sociability. And so on, not all drinking at home and so on and so forth uh, fell into the category or falls into the category of just wilder and controlled uh, space where that, that kind of uh, uh, uncontrolled decontrolling or whatever is, a, uh, is problematic. In, in fact, uh, you know, from my own small ethnography of this, I'm, I'm kind of struck by the extent to which actually people developed a new language of ritual around that, you know, so it wasn't as it were simply the reemergence of she beans or bush drinking or anything like that, but people redesignated their backyards as their own little pubs, including with names, including with times, including with, you know, uh, all of this, uh, uh, reconstituting on the basis of a, a sort of a gift relation. So in other words, what everybody thought was was Habermas once upon a time called it the uh, the colonization of the life world by system media and so on and so forth you know in the neoliberal language that became something different as well which was the claim that there is no such thing as society you know there are only individual uh, men and women in fact what the crisis of the uh, of uh, COVID and so on threw up very well and I think you bring this out very nicely is the persistence of the social right? The social is alive and well uh, and had been there all the time despite four decades of its being repudiated as non-existent and uh, in conditions where the usual forms of regulation control that ritual space, when they were removed, uh, it, it wasn't as if that there wasn't a moral order. In fact, through the practices of sociability and so on, people began to recode and recreate and re-symbolize what had presumed to be uh, 
a, a, a decentralized space. And that for me is kind of an extraordinary thing to emerge from, for, uh, from this. I, got, I was at a vaccination center the other day, I'll finish just from this point. I was at a vaccination center the other day and there was maybe four or 500 people at it. I was lined up. The incredible thing about it was the festive atmosphere in that situation you know, that after 80, 60 months or whatever of loss of sociability and so on, it persisted. People were chatting and uh, talking and so on, and especially so uh, sort of engaged in a sort of a celebratory conversation with the vaccinating staff, the personnel, the nurses and all of that kind of thing, because this was a quintessential gift economy moment. Uh, we had given up and sacrificed uh, this, that, and the other, all sorts of things for the last 18 months. And now here was a reciprocal gift in the form of uh, vaccination, a free gift for everybody and so on. And people responded equally well, indicating a sort of, a, not just a sort of even a collective effervescence because it wasn't sort of, uh, you know, wild excitement or anything like that, but an acknowledgement of the persistence and the resilience of society, despite the rumors of its having non-existed. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Thanks very much for that, Kieran.